Good afternoon and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOF webinar. This webcast is part of ACM SIGSOF's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOF webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track of the International Conference on Software Engineering as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I am Will Trace, Lockheed Martin Fellow Emeritus and most recent past chair of ACM SIGSOFT, the Special Interest Group of Software Engineering. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Before we get started, I'll like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide before you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing any problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R in Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device, or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click on the Submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived, and you will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Being Agile and Lean in Constrained and Regulated Environments by Paul McMahon. Paul has been an independent consultant for the last 20 years, helping organizations increase agility and process maturity. And he has published many articles and multiple books, including his latest book, It's All Upside Down, which is a collection of true software development stories, some of which he will be referencing in his talk today. Paul, without further ado, take it away. Thanks, Will. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Will Trace for moderating this webinar, and I'd like to thank Suzanne Miller and Marianne Lapham from the Software Engineering Institute for all the great work they have done on this topic, some of which I will be referencing. I'd also like to make it clear before getting started that the views expressed in this webinar are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of any branch of the federal government. So let's get started with a little background and motivation. In 2008, then Secretary of Defense for the US government, Robert Gates, said that we can't keep looking for the 100% solution. More precisely, he said that our conventional programs seek 99% solutions that take years, whereas the wars we are in today require 75% solutions in months. Before that point in time, people were trying agile approaches in defense companies, but they weren't openly talking about it because the belief back then was there was something wrong with being agile in a regulated environment. But Gates's comments in 2008 marked a key turning point that changed how the DOD viewed agile and lean approaches. And it eventually led to the new DOD instruction 5000.02, which I will be talking more about later. This webinar is about being agile and lean in constrained and regulated environments. But it isn't just about how to do it in the defense industry, because the challenges faced are similar in other regulated industries, including medical, pharmaceutical, and financial. Those challenges tie to what it really means to be agile and lean versus common false beliefs that today too many unfortunately still hold. And I will be shortly getting back to that phrase, be agile, because it may not mean what you think. I will also share tips and common pitfalls to help you locate your right level of being agile and lean while maintaining regulatory compliance. It's important to understand that the goal of this webinar is not to help you get around the regulations. Rather, it's to share techniques that can help you gain the real intent and value of Agile and Lean, as well as the regulations. I'm also going to assume in this webinar that the attendees already understand the motivation for Agile and Lean. However, I do want to clarify one key point related to the phrases being agile versus doing agile. 
Agile methods first officially arrived close to 15 years ago with the now famous meeting in Snowbird, Utah, where the Agile Manifesto was signed by 17 leading software methodologists. I say officially because Agile methods have actually been around much longer, as they really are based on grassroots efforts proven to work in many organizations, even going back 30 to 40 years. And I know this from personal experience, as my first job as a programmer in the early 70s was at a company that unofficially used many of these now popular approaches. At the most basic level, many people think Agile means following a certain set of practices that have become fairly well known over the past 15 years. Scrum and extreme programming are two of the more well-known approaches. But one common mistake often made is thinking that Agile just means following a certain set of practices. Suzanne Miller, who works at the SEI, and has authored numerous papers on agile and highly regulated environments, many with Mary Ann Lapham, explained at a talk she gave, and I attended, at the 2015 Agile West Conference, that too many organizations are just focusing on the practices and missing the principles and culture changes needed to gain the real benefits of Agile. She referred to this approach as installing Agile rather than becoming Agile. Other authors have referred to this difference as doing Agile versus being Agile. Examples include going through the motions of conducting a sprint and a demonstration, but failing to really collaborate with your customer or going through the motions of sprint planning and daily stand-up practices, but failing to really empower your team to self-manage. So let me give you a quick example from one of my own experiences. I was asked to help an organization that wanted to become agile. They were coming from a traditional strict waterfall process, which is common in highly regulated environments. Most of their projects were run by PMI certified project managers who were required to conduct detailed planning at project start, breaking all the work tasks down and assigning them to team members and then driving tasks to completion through weekly two hour status meetings. When I suggested that we should discuss their culture first to determine the right level of agility that would fit their organization, they didn't want to take the time. They said they had smart people. Just teach us the basics of Agile. We can do it. So against my better judgment, I gave them the training and the practices, which is what they wanted, and a number of problems quickly surfaced. As an example, after the first few daily stand-up meetings, the team members would go back to their workstation and just sit there waiting for someone to tell them what to do next. This was because that was the culture. What was missing was the recognition that a big part of Agile is a culture of self-direction, which means team members take charge and solve their own problems. This is an example of what Miller meant when she said you can't just install Agile practices. To get the needed culture changes, we had to coach the team members on the job, and we had to coach the managers, which, to be frank, was actually much more difficult. This point is particularly relevant to organizations that have a history of strict waterfall development and a top-down management style. Miller also referred in her talk to dangerous agile lookalikes. Let me give you an example. Let's say you are a project manager and your team says they want to try agile and they know how to do it. So you buy in and you agree to let them try it. And the first thing you hear is, this is great. It's easy. And it's even fun. If this happens to you, take it as a warning sign. Alarms should go off in your head. Agile is not easy at least not when a team is first trying to do it, that is if they're trying to do it right. In fact, it is often very stressful at first. One reason is the different cadence or rhythm that agile teams have to learn. Planning each sprint is usually an intense, short effort. And at the end of the planning session, the team commits to the work they will complete, usually in the next 30 days or shorter time. Because the sprint is short, the team is focused on meeting their commitment every day, 
which they demonstrate at the end of the sprint. Often it occurs on a Friday. Then the very next Monday, they are back into estimating and planning and committing again for the next sprint. And it often feels like there's just no break for the team. Another warning sign is when you see the team doing little planning and focusing on, on just coding right from the start and calling that agile. Agile teams actually, contrary to the belief of some, spend more time, not less time, planning and estimating. And all team members, not just managers, are involved in the planning and estimating. This is necessary to gain the team's honest commitment to the sprint goal before they jump into the development site. And I'm going to explain more later other ways how agile planning is different from traditional planning. Now, I don't have time in this short webinar uh, to go into all the ways the practices used by Agile teams differ from traditional approaches, especially those used in highly regulated environments. But I do want to talk about one more important difference, that is, and that is requirements management. And this example that I'm going to give you isn't from the Department of Defense, but from an experience I had with a commercial client in the insurance industry, which is another regulated industry. <clears throat> they hired me to teach them Scrum and coach them through their first few sprints because they wanted to become agile. We agreed to use a real project with real customer deadlines, which I have found is the best way to really help teams learn both the new practices and the culture changes needed. They wanted to be agile, but they also told me the requirements for the project were firm and they were all must-dos, something we often hear in regulated environments. Now, those of you who know something about Agile are probably thinking, well, there's just no way this can work because you must embrace change and you have to be willing to collaborate on your requirements if you really want to be Agile. Well, I didn't argue with them or tell them Agile won't work for them, but I did tell them, okay, but we still need to organize all your hard must-do requirements in a way that we can implement them iteratively in short sprints. To accomplish this organization, first I asked them to brainstorm five to ten goals that would make the project a success. I also gave them a criteria that their goals had to achieve. That criteria is known as INVEST, which stands for Independent, Negotiable, Valuable, Estimatable, Small, and Testable. I let them drop the negotiable for the time being because of their point about firm must-do requirements. We ended up with seven goals. I referred to each of the agreed goals as buckets. The next task was to allocate their requirements to each of the buckets and, if necessary, refine or split them. We then ranked the requirements from the value to the customer perspective. We first ranked the buckets and then ranked the requirements within the top three buckets. And by the way, if it, you can ask me later in the Q&A why uh, we just did the top three if, if it's not clear to you. So uh, the buckets in a ranked or in the ranked order were how we attacked the work for each sprint. As we moved forward with the sprints, we kept the goals of each sprint very clear to the team. And when we did the sprint reviews, we highlighted the goals to the stakeholders and then asked for their feedback as to whether we hit the goals. The first four sprints were resounding successes. And the product was so well liked, the customer wanted an early delivery to start using it before we finished the last three buckets. Now, I want to stop here for a minute. I want you to think about this. This leads us back to a very interesting question. What about all those non-negotiable must-do requirements, many of which were still in the last three buckets not yet completed? If they could use the product without all those requirements, just how non-negotiable were they in reality? What we learned from this story is that once the customer understood and agreed to the goals, 
they also realized that many of what they previously viewed as must-do requirements were just implementation approaches that they were used to from a legacy software product that they had used previously. As they learned how to do their job with the new product, they realized many of those firm must-do requirements were not really needed. So the point is that when you're applying Agile methods the right way, often you find that what you think are firm requirements are not. And this is an important aspect of Agile that can help address Gates's point about the 99% solution. Let me now give you another example from my It's All Upside Down book that also relates to Gates's point about the 99% solution. In that book, I tell a number of stories that challenge long-held thinking on fundamental software engineering principles. In story seven, I share what appears to be upside-down thinking on requirements and defects. Specifically, I ask the question, is it really always better to gather all your requirements early, even if you can? And I raised the question, is it possible that some defects are better never fixed? My requirements argument is based on real client stories, similar to the one I just shared about must-do requirements. One of my clients takes what many would call a real upside-down approach to requirements by never asking the customer for more detailed requirements but rather always showing them the simplest possible solution to their problem, even when they know it is highly unlikely to be accepted. Then when the customer says it isn't good enough, they simply ask, what are the one or two most important things that are missing in our solution? Using such a process, they pretty much ensure they never waste their time building unnecessary functionality and they always keep their development team focused on the most important things from a customer perspective. And I know many people will object to this approach. So if you're one of them, challenge me with a question or comment, and I'll explain more later when we get to the Q&A how this works. And my argument for not fixing certain defects comes from the recognition that whenever you make a change to fix something, there is risk of breaking something else and making things worse. So sometimes acceptable workarounds are more effective in practice than fixing known bugs. Now I know many people will object to this line of thinking, believing we're just working around bad software, but this is not always the case. For example, today, there are more and more software developers that are not doing new development, but rather are working changes to complex legacy systems that may have been around for a decade or longer and are successfully serving many satisfied customers. I know this for a fact because many of my clients fit this model. So this means more and more software developers are making changes to software systems they don't fully understand, which also means they don't fully understand all the potential impacts of a change they make. This means higher risk of unintended consequences for each change. Therefore, it makes sense that we should always be weighing the value of a change versus the risk of software breakage before proceeding with any change. Now I want to point out that some have argued that this line of reasoning could never work on projects with life critical applications such as Department of Defense fighter jet programs where defects could have catastrophic results. But my counter argument is that while a zero defect policy may be appropriate for specific life critical software applications, most major defense projects have a significant amount of non-life critical support software where they may be able to accept certain defects as long as they have acceptable workarounds. This line of thinking isn't just a theory. I have worked on such projects, and by thinking ahead about the type of software and categorizing it, you can relax certain stringent test practices on specific categories that don't have life-threatening consequences should they fail. And the reason you might want to do this gets back to Gates's comment on the wars we are in today, requiring 75% solutions in months 
rather than 99% solutions in years. And for those of you who are on the commercial side, even though you may not be in a literal war, your competition often requires that you get product to market faster every day to survive. So you really are in a war to survive. Let me take a five second water drink break. I'll be right back. <laughs> and I'll jump in and say oh. questions are welcomed at any time and thank you for those who have uh, chosen to submit them as we go along. Okay, back to you, Paul. Okay, thanks, Will. <clears throat> Okay, about 10 years ago, I wrote a paper that appeared in Crosstalk, the Journal of Defense Software Engineering, where I explained how management basics are affected when using Agile methods. That was actually the title of the paper. My fundamental message in that paper was that we do the same basic activities, but what changes is when we do them, how much we do of each, and exactly how we do them which gets at the being agile idea. But we never, underline never, bold never, uh, capitalize it, we never delete the fundamental building blocks. This idea is also at the core of many of the stories in my Upside Down book. Another example of this can be found in my story two, where you learn about a situation where a team is having trouble getting a key stakeholder to attend a sprint review. Rather than just go through the motions of the sprint review practice without the key stakeholder, which they realize would miss the goal of the sprint review, they come up with an innovative approach to gain the stakeholder's involvement, thus gaining the real value of the sprint review practice. Suzanne Miller and Marianne Lapham reach similar conclusions in a paper titled Parallel Worlds, Agile and Waterfall, Differences and Similarities, where they state that both Agile and traditional waterfall have common building blocks. They both have requirements, design, test, but they point out that what is different is the way these building blocks are used. I would add, both approaches also have documentation as well. But what is different is how much and what the documentation looks like. Now let's turn our attention to why the United States Department of Defense today is looking at Agile in a more positive light. Part of the reason goes back to Gates' speech in 2008, which actually occurred at the Defense University, where he said, our conventional modernization programs seek 99% solution in years. Stability and counterinsurgency missions, the wars we are in, require 75% solutions in months. The challenge is whether in our bureaucracy and in our minds, these two different paradigms can be made to coexist. I have highlighted the words at the end on two different paradigms coexisting because depending on the situation, each may still be appropriate. And they could both be appropriate on the same project, as my previous example about categorizing software pointed out. Another reason why the DOD is looking at Agile more positively today is because it is well known that the DOD acquisition process is broken. Now let's look at what the DOD has done to try to fix the acquisition process and how it is encouraging an appropriate use of Agile. And the reason I highlight the word appropriate will become clear in a few slides. First, Congress passed the Weapon System Acquisition Reform Act of 2009. The acquisition process is governed by Directive 5000.01, the Defense Acquisition System, and Instruction 5000.02, Operation of the Defense Acquisition System. And it utilizes procedures described in the Defense Acquisition Guidebook. The first important point to understand is that the Defense Acquisition System is not intended to be a rigid, one-size-fits-all process. For example, they recognize that acquiring information technology systems is different than acquiring missiles or next-generation fighter aircrafts. 
Instruction 5000.02 states, the structure of a DOD acquisition program and the procedures used should be tailored as much as possible to the characteristics of the product being acquired. And I will get back to that word tailored shortly. It is a big part of where we are headed in this webinar. Now, a key requirement in the regulation. And if you aren't familiar with the milestone B terminology, just think of it as a key decision point for approval to move forward. And I'm going to read this slowly because it is a mouthful, and I, I struggle every time I read this requirement. But milestone B approval requires a preliminary design review, formal post-preliminary design review assessment and certification on the basis of such assessment that the program demonstrates a high likelihood of accomplishing its intended mission. You can read that a number of times to, 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 to finally figure out what it's saying. Now, traditionally, the DOD has relied on extensive documentation and comprehensive point-in-time formal presentations to provide the needed assessment evidence to comply with this requirement. But, and this is a big but, it is important to understand this is not the only possible way to comply. Keep that word tailoring in mind. We're going to get back to it. Okay, now let's look closer at the challenge the DOD and other regulated industries face. And that is how to get the value out of the agile and lean approach. And this includes allowing the team to be agile, such as self-managing, which means allowing them to make smart decisions when faced with unanticipated situations, but also while not adding unacceptable risk of disasters from teams making really bad decisions. And if you doubt the validity of this concern, the fact is more than a few agile attempts in the past have led to disasters and cancellations. And if that fact surprises anyone, I have a reference at the end of my slides to a published case study of one of the largest agile disasters ever. And if you dig below the surface, you will find the root cause was a combination of failing to conduct fundamental activities, such as defining how progress would be monitored, how decisions would be documented, and how the system would integrate with other existing systems. So what we see is when projects seek a 75% solution, they often don't know what 25% to cut and what must be kept. And if you only take a few points away from this webinar, this is one of them. Keep it in mind. I'll get to the others shortly. So with this thought in mind, the remaining three webinar topics focus on how we can address this challenge. First, we will look at some observations about the DOD regulations and guidebook. And I would point out that similar observations can be made in other regulated industries. Second, I will explain what seems to be missing. And third, I'm going to share a few tips and pitfalls to be aware of moving forward to help you locate your right level of being agile in a regulated and or constrained environment. And if you have questions, too, on that word constrained and how that might differ from regulations, please, please do ask, and we can talk about that later as well. Okay, so first in terms of the observations. Let me start by pointing out that nowhere in 5000.02 will you see the word agile, and the reason is at least part because the DOD doesn't want to endorse or dictate a specific method or approach. However, the Defense Agile Acquisition Guidebook states that Agile has emerged as the leading industry software development methodology, and it states Agile practices enable the DOD to achieve reforms directed by Congress. And it goes on to state DOD Instruction 5002 heavily emphasizes tailoring. So while you don't have to be Agile to 
comply with 5002. It appears, according to the DOD's Agile Acquisition Guidebook, that being agile can make it easier. Also note that we're tailoring once again. Now, we're going to talk about what seems to be missing. Unfortunately, how to conduct effective tailoring is not well understood. And the DOD regulations and guidebooks don't provide how-to assistance or useful examples of good tailoring or tailoring pitfalls to help avoid the disasters as referenced previously. So who needs this missing guidance? Well, first you need to understand there's multiple levels of tailoring uh, where the missing guidance is in fact needed. First, the government acquisition personnel tailor before they ever let a request for proposal or RFP out to the public. Second, contractors can propose further tailored solutions in proposal responses. So both need the missing guidance. But I'm going to focus my tips and pitfalls to follow toward contractors. But I'd also like to point out that I will refer later to a third level of tailoring that we don't often think about, but we should. And with that, I'm going to take another drink of water. I'll be back in five seconds. Okay, and I'm back. Well, okay. All right, did you want to say something, Will? No, no, please continue. Okay. All right, so uh, tip one. Know what is really being asked for. This may sound obvious, but please don't take it for granted, and I'm going to explain why. It's very important today that contractors read carefully what's in an RFP, uh, because uh, it may be a, it, RFP is, could be asking for uh, it, it may it may sound like they're just asking for the same stuff. It's easy to just assume the DOD is asking for the same deliverables with extensive documentation and planned formal big event reviews as in the past. However, with acquisition reform, the government is now making changes to the words they use in, in RFPs. And sometimes you have to read it carefully to see what they're really asking for, because the word changes may seem minor, which is why you can just kind of gloss over this. For example, you know, don't expect them to come right out and ask explicitly for an agile approach for reasons I explained earlier. But sometimes small changes in wording open the door for innovative proposals. As a simple example, you see more and more related to deliverables, words like contractor format acceptable. It's easy to just gloss over that thinking they just want the same old traditional heavyweight documentation and reviews. But maybe that is exactly what they don't want. Pitfall number one, your company culture is stuck. Now this pitfall close, is closely related to the tip one I just talked about. What we often see today, even on projects where the government is trying to open the door to innovative approaches, is a hesitancy on the side of contractors to propose anything uh, that looks different from what has been done in the past for fear of being perceived as non-compliant. This also ties to the culture issue previously discussed of being versus doing agile. As a result, an organization could wrongly decide that all they need to do to get the value of lean and agile is to say in their proposal and to tell their teams to follow the common scrum practices like daily stand-ups and sprint reviews, thinking that means they're agile. My next tip will help you avoid this pitfall. But first, I want to get back to the, the fear of the non-compliance issue. You know, a lot of people think that the whole problem with the government acquisition process is on the government side. But sometimes the government actually wants to change and the problem is in the quality checks inside contractor organizations because they're still checking for traditional looking items. In other words, sometimes the problem isn't the regulations themselves. And, and I want to point this out too, this, this is true on the commercial side as well, but rather uh, contractors failing to realize the options they have within the regulations the way they are written today. 
Tip number two, use concrete examples to explain your proposed approach. One approach I highly recommend is for contractors to explain in their proposals how they are open to sharing their data in whatever form they naturally keep it for use by their teams and customer oversight personnel. Consider provide, providing concrete examples of the type of documentation you plan to provide and include rationale for why you may be proposing something that looks different, but also be sure to explain how what you are proposing meets the intent of any contractual documentation requirements. And you, you need to understand the intent of your documentation requirements to do this. If it is to prove your team is doing the right things for oversight people, Sharing your data in its natural form is a far more effective solution. As an example, when Agile teams maintain artifacts uh, visible to the whole team on the walls in their control room where they hold their daily stand-up meetings or in tools and or wikis that are accessible to the whole team and to the customer, then less traditional formal deliverable documentation and reviews may be appropriate. Keep in mind that lean is about getting rid of waste. But don't fall into the trap of thinking agile development means no documentation. Pitfall number two, we'll figure it out as we go. Let me now give you an example of what not to do in your proposal, and that is to use the lean and agile buzzwords with some high-level words about agility, but to provide no real credible plan or concrete examples of how you plan to meet contractual deliverables. Being agile doesn't mean figure it out as we go. It is true with an agile approach, we need to be able to adapt to changing requirements even late in the game, and we continually improve our processes as we go, but we don't create our processes for the first time as we go. Pitfall number three, tailoring down. The idea of tailoring is not new. However, the way this tailoring exercise has often been conducted in the past in many high regulatory organizations represents the antithesis of what it means to be agile and lean, and it is fraught with potential problems. First, it's often conducted in what I call a tailoring down manner. This means you're given a long list of potential products to produce and or activities to conduct, and you have to go through the lengthy exercise of explaining which ones you don't need. The problem with this approach is first that it runs the risk of someone making a wrong decision and tailoring out an essential product or activity, which can lead to the disasters as mentioned earlier. The second problem is that it is wasteful. Lean is about eliminating waste, and the best way to start to eliminate waste is by not requiring someone to go through the extra work of explaining why they don't need to do something that isn't essential. Tip number three, tailor up. Start with a small list of essentials that are required on all endeavors. Then add what else is needed, uh, what, what else kind of essential, above the essentials that you need for your project. For example, you could add specific security or reliability requirements. Such a tailoring up approach is both efficient and it eliminates the risk of tailoring out an essential. Another reason that tailoring up makes sense, particularly in a high regulatory environment, is because oversight personnel need a way to evaluate the adequacy of any tailoring decisions. A minimal checklist starting point can, uh, can provide a good basis from which to build a full checklist that can be used to ensure you're meeting both essentials for success and meeting regulatory requirements. So this leads to an important question. Where should you look for such a minimal essential starting point set? This leads to my next tip for uh, consider using essence rather than reinventing the starting essentials. Essence is an OMG standard that provides such a minimum essential starting point set. And for those who haven't heard of Essence, uh, let me give you a, a little bit of background on it. 
An effort began in 2010 referred to as CMAT, or Software Engineering Method and Theory. This effort was envisioned by Ivar Jakobsen and two advisors and included volunteers from around the world, including industry, academia, and research to define such a minimum set of essentials or a common ground for all software engineering endeavors. The results of, of that effort led to an OMG standard uh, in 2014 referred to as Essence. Essence's roots can be traced back to 2005 when Ivar Jakobsen International redesigned RUP or the Rational Unified Process and presented it as ESSUP or Essential UP. The Essence standard meets three important goals for any set of minimum essentials for successful software endeavors. Goal one, widely agreed upon, including a minimum set of checklists supporting being agile. And I'm going to get back and give you some examples of what I mean by that shortly. Goal two, independent of any specific practices or method. This makes it attractive to any group that does not want to endorse a specific approach, such as the Department of Defense. Goal three, extensible to support additional specific project needs. This makes it attractive to those with regulations or, and or constraints that need to be added in. Now I want to explain how Essence checklists differ from traditional checklists and how they support being agile and provide the kind of checks needed given today's challenges. Traditional checklists are what I call check-the-box checks or existence checks. An example would be checking that a document exists, but the existence of a document doesn't tell us if it's any good or if it's achieving its purpose. This is the problem, by the way, too many organizations that use the CMMI have gotten into, but that's another topic, maybe another webinar for another day. Now, recall I mentioned earlier, there is a third level of tailoring that isn't often recognized, but needs to be. And that is the fact that agile teams actually tailor frequently as part of their sprint retrospective practice. And the second most important point I hope you take away from this webinar is the fact that when most agile teams get into trouble, it's when they conduct that tailoring without an agreed to common ground of essentials that they know that, that can never be deleted. Essence checklists help teams think about their program circumstances when making decisions, which is what 5000.02 is asking for, and it is what being agile is really about. And Essence checklists help teams think about when a 75% solution is good enough by helping them consider the things that can be cut without jeopardizing essentials for success. So now let me give you some examples. And the examples are with respect to the checklists pointed to by the arrows in the figure. Starting on the left, with respect to requirements, an essence checklist leads the team to ask, have enough been addressed to be acceptable? Maybe we don't need all of them. Recall my requirements story. With respect to the software system, an essence checklist leads the team to ask, do the stakeholders want the system? That's usually a pretty good indication if it's good enough. And again, recall my requirements story. And another essence checklist leads the team to ask, are the defect levels acceptable? Maybe the system isn't perfect, but if workarounds exist, it may be good enough. Now, here are three more examples that show how Essence checklists support software essentials for success to make sure you don't cut the wrong things and end up like one of those disastrous cancellations. As, as you think about these checklists, recall the case study I referenced about the major agile disaster where the root cause could be traced back to fundamentals that were missed. You won't find any Essence checks for extensive documentation, but you will find an essence check for whether a credible plan is in place, and, which includes knowing how progress will be monitored. Note the arrow on the, on, on the far left checklist. And you won't find an essence check 
for formal meetings, but you will find a check that asks if key stakeholders are involved, providing timely feedback and decisions. Note the arrow on the middle check in, in the figure. And you won't find an essence check for just going through the motions of conducting specific practices, but you will find a check to make sure practices and tools exist and have been adjusted to the endeavors context and are supporting effective collaboration. And that, folks, is what tailoring is supposed to be all about. And one more down there at the bottom, and you will find a check to ensure critical interfaces are demonstrated. So let me just leave you with a final takeaway point. And I've tried to keep this to about 45 minutes, so we have plenty of time for questions. Tailoring is a key to locating your right level of agility. However, tailoring brings risk of loss of essentials, including loss of regulatory requirements if done without a minimum agreed common ground. Essence is a new OMG standard that can provide the needed common ground starting point for those seeking to become agile and lean while ensuring regulatory compliance. And it includes the kind of checklists needed in today's world where often rapid and difficult decisions, including trade-offs, need to be made. I would also like to point out that because of the way the checklists were developed, Essence has been referred to as a thinking framework. And I also published an article in Crosstalk in the January-February issue of, I believe it was 2015, uh, on how it can be used uh, as a thinking framework. And I included that article in my references at the end of my slides. Now to conclude, Essence doesn't tell your team the answer, but it helps your team find the right answer given their program circumstances. And isn't that really what we are all searching for? If you're interested in learning more about Essence, Essence User's Guide and Checklists and other related aids are available for download free of charge from the CMAT website. You can also find references to books and other publications on Essence on the CMAT website. And on the, my final slide in this presentation, there's a full list of publications and websites that I referenced in this talk and my slides are being made available in PDF format for download by participants. So with that, I'm gonna uh, turn this back over to Will to moderate any questions. Thank you, Paul. Nicely said, I, I really enjoyed your talk and uh, well done. So uh, I would uh, first like to say is uh, we have a handful of, uh, actually a very nice selection of questions. Uh, there's no no problem there, but if you would like to have Paul follow up with any more uh, webinars, uh, just drop us a note and uh, in the question and, and uh, box, and we will. I will be glad to uh, bring that up with Paul. Or if you have any other topics that you would like to uh, see SIGSOFT webinars uh, address. Uh, so, with that said, let's move on to the questions. first question is, uh, how did the architecture help or hinder the sprints? Uh, the architecture, I guess I, I, that leads me to a question. When we're talking about the architecture, are we talking about the product architecture? Well, actually, I won't elaborate. I mean, architecture is a high-level design, and uh, whether it's a system architecture or software architecture, your choice of how you put it into context. All right, all right. Here's how I would answer. Question. Okay. No, no, no. I, I would like to answer that question. I, I think that the, the tie into architecture, uh, the tie I like to make to it is into the into the the work breakdown. Because if, if you have a solid architecture, the next question is, how do I break the work down? Because a, the key thing for the sprints is to adequately break the work down. And the team needs to be able to estimate. The team need, this is the big part about team members. They are the ones that are doing the planning. And you need to know uh, how to break the work down and how to estimate that work. And so I think the tie back to architecture 
is the fact that it provides that first framework from which you can then need to identify the priorities, which pieces need to be done first, which are the risk areas in the architecture, uh, which, by the way, in, in, the ass, in essence, one of the checks is, are the key architectures demonstrated? And that's an early checklist. So I think there is a tie between architecture and, and work breakdown. Uh, to me, and and that that's key to uh, the team knowing the work they're doing and being able to estimate and to commit to that work. So I think that may be where that question's coming from. Hopefully, hopefully I'm interpreting it correctly. Good, good. Uh, this question just came in. I couldn't resist. Are there still software projects where waterfall makes more sense? And this might be in your opinion. Oh, this is a great question. I love it. Uh, and and I, and my answer is going to be yes, and let me tell you why. Um, it, it, I, I'm going to kind of answer it two ways, but the, the first one is everybody needs to understand that collaboration isn't free. So going back to my requirement story, if in fact you know all your requirements, then don't collaborate. Don't use an agile approach because it, it, it costs more to collaborate. Now, the fact is what we're learning is when people think they know requirements, they usually don't. So that's why agile is becoming so popular. But if, in fact, you're in a situation where you really know every requirement and it's perfectly understood, then why, why would you collaborate? Because it costs more effort to continually go back and involve the customer. Just go build the thing. So that is an a case. Now, I will just caveat all that with, uh, in my 40 plus years of doing uh, software development, 20 as a contractor and now 20 as, as a consultant, uh, I've actually yet to see that actually happen. I, I know I've got people that think they know their requirements, but every day we get smarter. And no matter how well we think we understand the requirements on day one, halfway through the program, we usually have a very much better understanding of what we need to build, and it's usually not what we thought at the start. That's why Agile makes sense. Well, this leads to uh, nicely into another question. Does the Agile team tailoring introduce derived slash engineered requirements? And I think I will extrapolate that into just what you were talking about in answering about unknown requirements that uh, might uh, then be better addressed in an agile approach. Yeah, and and that is absolutely true. The you w when you do the planning up front, you take your best cut at the requirements. But because those sprints, you're learning absolutely that the team will, will come up with derived requirements or what I sometimes call implementation requirements. The product backlog tends to be focused on the customer requirements, but the team comes up with their own, you can view them as requirements or work, implementation work that has to get done. But still, it's more work, that the, and so the team does come up with internal architecture requirements, if you will, uh, and so, and, and that goes back to why I said when I was working with my requirements uh, case study, that we only prioritized the first three sprints because even though they thought they had all must-do requirements, I knew after three sprints they would look at this and, and they would see there's no sense spending a lot of time on the fourth and the fifth because the priorities are going to change and new requirements are going to be injected. And so that is why th this is actually why sprint teams or scrum teams and agile teams spend more time planning because you continually replan. And you replan to keep the plan accurate. And the other point I'd make to this is another really strong, powerful reason to be agile is agile teams, when it's done right, actually you get far better estimates for just this reason. And this is why this is why we really need to train the managers to empower the teams because that's where you get your – they know the work. And, and, and so we need to involve them, and, and Agile is leading us to really uh, help developers learn the skill of, of, of self-management and self-estimate. Uh, you know, when I was young and, and working at my first company, an old guru told me, one of the things you want to do 
is learn to estimate. And he goes, if you can estimate, you'll always be good at your job. And that's something we uh, we really need to do. We need to teach our developers how to estimate because it also causes them to self-reflect. And when they when they when they estimate, they self-reflect and they learn. And then they become better at what they do because they know where they have weaknesses. And estimating actually helps them improve their own skills. O over that's to you, I Will. I think you just answered one of the questions on estimation that came in, and I'll switch to a. In your opinion, a different question, is there a programming language that works best for Agile projects? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, clearly, there uh, are certain domains that people are uh, using Agile more in. You know, there has been this resistance in, in the regulated environments and as opposed to where you're in the commercial world, maybe doing cloud computing and, and you know using languages like Ruby on Rails, that really it fits very nice there. But I don't think there's there's an area it doesn't fit. And, and the reason I say that is even even if I take like a DoD fighter jet program, that that is really you know you you want to try to get your requirements obviously up front. But I'm going to go back to that example. Usually on these big defense programs where you might say maybe it doesn't fit so well, there is an incredible amount of support software where that, that is supporting, say, the embedded uh, critical applications where it fits perfectly. And so, so I, I actually spent I've, – I've written a number of papers on hybrid Agile. And I think where we really need to get our minds wrapped around is that probably very few projects are pure agile, you know, the pure scrum out of the box. We always have to do this tailoring, and that's why it's so important. So even on the ones that there are these certain applications where we probably have to be a more be following a little bit more of a strict waterfall uh, to get the requirements up front, there's in those same projects, the developer sitting next to you could be working on something where he's in a much more agile environment. So I believe all projects can can benefit from a degree of agility, but we need to learn to tailor appropriately to figure out where it fits and where it doesn't. And we need to teach our, our, our uh, developers through their retrospectives to do the same thing because they're learning. They're the ones that are figuring this out the fastest, and they need to know where those limits are, where they can't tailor something out. And that, that's really the theme of this whole webinar. I think that's where we get in trouble because I, I go in and do a lot of root cause analysis. I, you know, a lot of the work I get is when projects are in trouble and they call me in to, to figure out what's going on here. And it comes back to those basics. It comes back to somebody tailored some fundamental out. And we that that's what we have to come back to. But to get back to your question, uh I, I don't I, I don't think uh I don't think there's a place where a degree of agility and leanness doesn't make sense. Okay. I'm going to ask two questions. You choose which one since we're running out of time you want to answer or maybe you can answer both quickly. Are there any significant differences between different Agile methods, for example, Scrum, XP, whatever, when becoming Agile in a regulated, constrained environment? And the second question has to do with cross-country teams. Does Agile support shared resources, follow-the-sun type uh, uh, models for uh, software development? So that second question, are we, are we talking about distributed teams? Is that what? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the first question. Yeah. So the first question is that what I see happening is is uh, this gets back to the tailoring and the hybrid that very few are just go we're a scrum house and we don't use XP. Well, I don't see that. I see everybody. Scrum seems to be the framework that that the, those basic you know the daily stand up the, the retrospective the sprint review. This most everyone is moving in this direction, but that doesn't mean they don't tailor in some XP. Test-driven development is also a practice which is not specifically part of Scrum, but most Agile teams use it. So uh, it, it, the the point is, this is part of a tailoring, I, and I don't think it's like Scrum 
fits here, an XP fits there. It's we have to look at your situation and understand your, your, your constraints and your regulations to come up with the, what, what's best for you. In, in terms of, of the, you know, when Agile first began, uh, they were all, everybody was saying, in fact, this is what got me into it. The first book I wrote was on distributed development, distributed teams, virtual project management. And I came to Agile from the reverse end of most people. Most people said Agile is about small teams that are all co-located. It doesn't work when you're distributed. And in fact, what I was finding is that no, no, it's the best thing to solve the communication problem when teams are distributed. So, so I started. I came to Agile and said, "This is the way to solve the distributed problem because the whole thing is communication." And you know, the daily stand-ups and the continuous planning really are great for uh, for getting communication happening. And and it's easy to solve the problem when teams are distributed, and even when you scale up, because we use the Scrum of Scrums. And, and, and we, but we still use the same fundamental practices. So they're absolutely applicable to, to any size, and they're also act, absolutely applicable to when your team is distributed or, or uh, co-located. So, so I don't see, and I don't see, I, I'm, I'm reaching the conclusion that I don't see any cases where certain, certain tailored versions of agile approaches don't fit. And so getting back to the point of this webinar, it fits perfectly with regulations as well and, and with constraints. And, and, and we need, and you know, whether, whether you, you want to use essence or not, you should take away the fact you need a common ground. And everybody needs to agree what their common ground is if they want to avoid the disasters. Back to you, okay, Will. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm afraid we've run out of time today, and I'd like to thank Paul again for his informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. Special thanks goes to you for uh, you all for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. For those who joined us late, this webinar will be recorded and will be available online in a few days at uh, www.sixsoft.org. Uh, uh, yeah, resources, webinars, HTML. You can uh, find announcements for upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org. On behalf of SIGSOFT, the speaker, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This is the conclusion of today's webinar. <laughs>